Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Guido Rianna and I work at CMCC, Roman Terran Center on Climate Change. Thank you for attending today the CMCC webinar on agroecological agro practices for climate change mitigation. The speaker will be Chiara De Notaris, working in the division impacts on agriculture, forests, and ecosystem services located in Viterbo. Before leading to her, the floor, I would like to spend a few words about uh, CMCC, my organization. CMCC is established in 2005 as a nonprofit research organization. It became a foundation in 2015. CMCC is a scientific research organization working on climate change and this interaction with society, environment, the world of business and policymakers. Our work is to promote a sustainable group, to protect the environment, to develop strategies for adaptation and mitigation to climate change. The CMCC is organized in the form of a network uh, distributed throughout the country with, loca with the locations in uh, Milano, Venezia, Bologna, Viterbo, Caserta, Lecce e Sassari and uh, benefits from the extensive applied experience of these members and institutional partners. For example, uh, the University of Salento, the University of Sassari, the Poly Politecnico di Milano, uh, Università di Tacca Foscari, Istituto Nazionale di Geofisica e Vulcanologia, Resources for the Futures, and the University of Bologna. So, the scientific organization organization is structured in different research divisions covering the different aspects associated with the climate change issue. For example, adv advanced scientific computation, research division, climate simulation and prediction, or the two divisions today involved, impacts on agricultural forces, ecosystem services, and my division, regional models and geological impacts. Nevertheless, such organization is aimed at promoting and integrating different interdisciplinary skills. Uh, since 2008, CMCC operates its own supercomputing center located within the University of Salento campus in Lecce, and is currently is the only computational facility in Italy specializing in climate change research. Nevertheless, outreach represents an important and a very important aspect in CMCC activities in different forms for several audiences, articles in peer-reviewed journals, educational programs, communication and uh, dissemination activities like this webinar. So now, uh, now few rules about the Q&A session. Your audio and video are deactivated by default. If you need to intervene or ask a question, you can either write in Q&A section or use the resend features, and I will give you the floor. The webinar will be recorded and uploaded on CMCC YouTube channel. If you have any further question about the webinar, please email webinar at cmcc.it. Don't forget to follow us on social media channels. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure, pleasure to leave the floor to my colleague Chiara De Notaris. Thank you. Thank you, Guido, for the introduction. I will then share my screen. Yes. <laughs> It will take a few seconds before it appears in presentation mode. <clears throat> okay. So um, I'm Chiara De Notaris. I work at the division Impact on Agriculture, Forests and Ecosystem Services, as Guido um, already uh, explained, one of the many divisions of CMCC. I'm located in Viterbo. Um, but before arriving here almost one year ago, I spent several years in Denmark working at the Department of Agroecology at Aarhus University. <clears throat> 
So today I would like to share with you um, some insights on agroecological practices for climate change mitigation. Um, I would like to start by briefly introducing our ecology, climate change mitigation and adaptation, and then focus on how agroecological practices can help to mitigate climate change. But in particular, I will focus on cover crops, which is only one of the many agroecological practices. Um, and this is because I've worked with cover crops for several years. Um, so I would like to share some uh, results on carbon, nitrogen, and how to manage um, for the best uh, utilization of this practice. So agroecology has several definitions uh, that have evolved throughout the years, but some key concepts remain. So agroecology can be defined as an integrative approach to ecological, economic, and social dimensions of the entire food system. So it's a very broad concept that includes several aspects that overlap partly with the concept of sustainability. And there are three pillars of agroecology, um, the science, the practice, and the social movement pillar. One very important char characteristic of agroecology is that it is highly context specific, so that um, in some contexts, the social movement dimension might be more relevant than in others. Um, the context where I've operated uh, was particularly focused on the practice and the science aspects, and that is what I will focus on today. Um, <clears throat> agroecological practices aim at increasing diversity in the system and also at increasing the efficiency, so reducing the need for external inputs. This is done by choosing different cultivars, um, by improving fertilization methods, uh, as well as irrigation, and also increasing the diversity in time and space. This is done, for example, by having crop rotations, but also intercropping. Um, the inclusion of cover crops in crop rotations is one of the practices aimed at redesigning cropping systems for increased efficiency, for example. This way, agroecology can contribute to reaching several of the sustainable development goals, uh, going from um, zero hunger to increased biodiversity, but also all the social dimension that, again, I would not focus on today, but is very relevant for agroecology. Focusing on climate change, diversified systems are better able to cope uh, with change, so also changes related to climate change. Um, and then they can also increase, for example, carbon sequestration, which contributes to mitigation of climate change. And I think that the audience here today probably knows of this already, but just to um, have a brief recap of what we mean with climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, climate change mitigation is about reducing emissions or enhancing the sinks of greenhouse gases. So the aim of mitigation is reducing impacts, while adaptation is about adjusting to changes. So here the aim is to moderate harm or exploit beneficial opportunities. These are both very important and have to be considered simultaneously to avoid uh, possible trade-offs. Um, focusing on mitigation, uh, yeah, focusing on mitigation, um, the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector called AFOLU in um, by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, contributes a large proportion of emissions. Uh, in 2019, it contributed 22% of total emissions um, of greenhouse gases. And when we look only at the agricultural sector, half of this, so 11%, uh, came from agriculture. And in this sector, it's particularly relevant uh, methane and nitrous oxide uh, coming from livestock production, but also the use of fertilizers. <clears throat> 
But land can also be a sink of carbon, therefore mitigating climate change. Always the IPCC developed uh, a special report on climate change in land, where among the many things that they discussed, they also um, make simulations with very optimistic scenarios on how um, to reach carbon neutrality within the land sector. And in all cases, it's necessary that land becomes also, or yeah, the, the pot potential for land to be a sink of carbon increases. So more carbon needs to be stored in the soil. And this can be done uh, by utilizing new technology, for example, carbon capture and storage, and that's the dark brown in the figure, um, but also simply by increasing carbon sequestration in the soil, for example, adopting um, several management practices, of which agroecological practices are some of them. In fact, the mitigation potential of agroecological practices is relatively high, uh, always according to the IPCC. Um, there is high to very high mitigation potential of practices like agroforestry, increased soil organic matter content, but also residue management and, and others. And as I was mentioning before, it's important to consider mitigation and adaptation simultaneously. So it's important not to forget the mitigation aspect. In this case, adaptation is a win-win so that there, there's high to very high adaptation potential for all um, agroecological practices related to cropland management. So coming to the juicy part, um, Cover crops are only one of the agroecological practices that can be considered for climate change mitigation. Um, and of course, never forgetting adaptation, but in particular focusing on mitigation. And in a recent meta-analysis, and a meta-analysis is a systematic synthesis of studies aimed at assessing the overall effect of something. So in a recent meta-analysis, they found that the overall effect of cover crops, so across many different conditions and species and management, um, was an increase of more than 15% in soil organic carbon compared to not having cover crops. Um, and in quantitative terms, uh, this translates into uh, more than half a ton of carbon per hectare, more. So this amount of carbon extra can be sequestered and kept in the soil. And what the <clears throat> authors of this study concluded is that if 50%, 15%, sorry, of the current global cropland adopted cover crops, so not all global land, just cropland adopted cover crops, then the carbon sequestration uh, derived from this practice would account for one to two percent of current fossil fuel emissions. And this doesn't sound like much, um, but when we look at why cover crops increase carbon sequestration, then it becomes quite interesting. Cover crops are plants that are sown intentionally, so it's not like uh, leaving your field um, fallow without any cultivation. You intentionally sow some crops um, that are not aimed at being harvested. Their aim is to provide some services, for example, preventing soil erosion or reducing nutrient losses. And what they do is that they grow in the period between cash crops. So it's a period that would otherwise be unproductive. And they generally grow throughout um, autumn and winter, depending on the type. There can also be summer cover crops. Um, and if they grow during winter, then they can die off during winter, or they can be terminated mechanically or with herbicides. And then the residues are left on the field or plowed in. So what happens is that there is an extra uh, amount of carbon that is sequestered in plant biomass and then returned to the soil. So this is the interesting part, that cover crops are a free uh, extra source of extra carbon because they bring it 
during a period that would be unproductive. And because we sow cover crops intentionally, then we can also choose the species and how to manage it to uh, optimize the productivity. And <clears throat> I would like to show you along the way some experimental results from studies that I've con conducted um, with my colleagues during the last few years in Denmark. In one of these experiments, um, we tried to quantify carbon input from cover crops uh, managed in different ways. Um, quantification of total carbon input is not easy because of uh, the below ground part. So when we think about carbon input, it includes the above ground biomass, which is relatively easy to sample. But then there is also root biomass and the carbon deposited in the soil which are not as easy to quantify because of, yeah, you need to dig out roots and also find something that it's not possible to see. There are several methods for doing it. Uh, and here we used an isotopic labeling technique, um, allowing us to trace the fate of carbon uh, in the plant and in the soil. And what we could see is that under these specific conditions, total carbon input from cover crops was less than one ton of carbon per hectare, which is quite uh, low compared to the average from another recent global meta-analysis um, that estimated uh, an average carbon input from cover crops of about two tons of carbon per hectare. So what this points out to is that the amount and allocation of carbon varies greatly based on species management and environmental conditions. So it's quite difficult to, to generalize, but it's also necessary to do it. Besides the effect on carbon, <clears throat> cover crops are sown, as I mentioned before, because they perform many ecosystem services. Um, so there's preventing um, soil erosion, but also um, in some cases, some species can have some allelopathic effect, uh, for example, reducing the occurrence of weeds. But one important uh, service is also preventing losses of nutrients that are left from the previous crop. Uh, and in particular, nitrogen, <coughs> which um, in mineral form, so nitrate is mobile and can be lost via, for example, nitrate leaching. Um, so sowing cover crops during the unproductive period allows retaining this nitrogen. Um, and then if legumes are included in cover crop mixtures or directly sown as cover crops, there can also be an additional input of nitrogen via biological nitrogen fixation. All of this is stored in cover crop biomass. And when cover crop biomass dies off and is incorporated in the soil, then nitrogen is made available for the following crop, therefore reducing the need for new input. All of this, again, aims at improving the efficiency of the system and reducing the need for external inputs. And at the same time, uh, benefiting the environment because, of course, having losses of nutrients to, for example, freshwater systems can have um, severe consequences for biodiversity, for example. Again, some experimental results. Um, <clears throat> this study was conducted on a long-term field experiment um, with several crop rotation types. And what we could see was that um, in all of the systems that we investigated, there was a significant effect of having cover crops on nitrate leaching. So we had a significant reduction in nitrate leaching when we had cover crops compared to not having cover crops. And this was irrespective of having or not having legumes as cover crops in the mixture. <clears throat> And as I, as I was mentioning before, having legumes in the cover crop means also bringing in 
extra nitrogen to the system with biological nitrogen fixation, which generally accounts for 70 to 90 percent of above ground nitrogen. And again, in uh, one of the recent studies um, that we conducted in Denmark, we quantified the input by red clover sown as a cover crop um, during three years under field conditions. And here we could see that the amount, so the quantity of nitrogen derived from biological nitrogen fixation varied greatly um, in different years. And that it was strictly connected to how well the, the plant was growing. So environmental conditions were, uh, were critical. And of course, when biomass production was highest than also nitrogen input to the system, extra nitrogen input to the system was highest. And one of the objections in these cases is that having this extra input could lead to increased losses of nitrogen through nitrate leaching. But what we could see was that this didn't happen. So even when we had, and I don't know if you can see my mm, arrow now, but even when we had a high um, above ground biomass production of clover, then nitrate leaching was low and stable. And this was because, um, this specific case, clover was grown in mixture with non-legumes. So when there was a high risk of nitrate leaching, then the non-legume um, took over. So there was a self-regulating effect between the species, um, which helped improving the provision of ecosystem services related to nitrogen in this case. But can the extra nitrogen input be a problem in some other way? Uh, it, uh, in this recent study by Lugato and his colleagues, they could see that, um, well, when we take into account nitrous oxide emissions, then having this extra input of nitrogen could actually be a problem. Nitrous oxide is a potent uh, greenhouse gas with a much higher uh, global warming potential compared to carbon dioxide, and it has a longer lifetime in the atmosphere. So by increasing the, the time perspective, so looking at the long term, having an increased risk of nitrous oxide emissions would um, offset the positive effect of carbon sequestration derived from, from cover crops. So that final um, greenhouse gas balance was uh, negative. So there were positive emissions rather than negative emissions. But this brings um, a lot of uncertainties because nitrous oxide emissions are affected by many, many factors. And one of these factors is management. So in a follow-up study, they could see that um, the risk of nitrous oxide emissions from cover crops could actually be reduced by integrated management, which in this case meant um, adjusting the selection of cover crop species in time. So when the potential for carbon sequestration was about to reach uh, its maximum, because it's subject to saturation, so when it was about to reach the saturation level, then we switched from having legumes in the cover crop mixtures to not having the legumes anymore. So they switched the species. And in that way, they managed to reduce nitrous oxide emissions and still have uh, negative emissions. So a positive effect on carbon um, sequestration. Again, um, some experimental results on species selection. This is from the last field experiment that I conducted in Denmark. Um, what we looked at here was a different cover crop species grown in pure stand and in mixture. And in particular, we had um, plantain, which is a forb, red clover, which is a legume, and ryegrass, which is a grass. Um, 
and then the mixture of ryegrass and plantain, ryegrass, plantain, and red clover. And these were grown in two years in two separate fields. So we could also look at the effect of year. And biomass production, as expected, varied greatly with cover crop species, but also with year. So in 2020, we had a much higher biomass production. Um, and the highest biomass production was with red clover and the mixture including red clover. So when the legume was there, we had more biomass. Uh, which of course also implies a higher input of carbon and um, that was almost uh, two tons per hectare in the mixture with um, with with red clover and this and this only from above ground biomass also higher input of nitrogen which again in the mixture uh, with red clover was 128 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare only in above ground biomass. And a, about 80%, 87% uh, of this nitrogen came from biological nitrogen fixation. So it was extra nitrogen added to the system. So again, the question, what happens to this nitrogen? So there's a lot of extra nitrogen added to the system. Where does it go? Do we increase the risk of losses? We traced um, the fate of mineral nitrogen in the soil throughout autumn and winter. What we could see was that the with red clover, so either in pure stand or in mixture, we had a greater soil mineral nitrogen concentration in the following spring. So following the cover crop that included a legume, we had more mineral nitrogen in the soil. And at this point, yeah, this nitrogen could either be lost or end up somewhere else. And to test this, we um, we grew uh, a following crop, which was spring barley, which was sown at the beginning of April. And what we could see was that spring barley that was grown in plots that had a cover crop with red clover had a similar uh, yield compared to plots that received 100 kilograms of mineral nitrogen per hectare. And what I didn't say now is that, um, of course, barley that was grown in plots that had cover crops before didn't receive any other form of uh, mineral or any other form of nitrogen. So um, all the nitrogen in uptaken by barley was coming from the cover crop or something that was already in the soil. But again, having the, the that extra mineral nitrogen in the soil ended up in the following crop. One other aspect to consider is that it is actually the residues. So cover crop residues are what increases the risk of uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, in this study, what they investigated um, yeah, was the effect of different management um, um, on the, the risk of nitrous oxide emissions. And what they could see was that incorporating the residues or leaving them on the surface didn't, have, uh, didn't make a big difference because what made a big difference was keeping or not keeping the residues. And this was particularly true for mature crop residues and immature crop residues refer to um, crops that are green, for example, cover crops. So keeping cover crop residues in the field can on one hand increase nitrogen availability for the following crop, for example, but again also increase the risk at least of nitrous oxide emissions. So one other option, um, I mentioned that one option is the selection of species and, um, and that there are several environmental factors affecting risks of nitrous oxide emissions and other losses. But one other option is removing above ground residues of core crops. And this could be done 
if enough biomass is produced so that it could be used, for example, for feed or bio bioenergy or biochar. Um, and then actually the carbon and nitrogen would not be completely uh, removed from the system because it could always be returned to the field in other forms, for example, animal manure, biochar or digestate, maybe also in forms with lower risks of emissions. But many considerations should be done in this respect and uh, all system perspectives should be adopted to evaluate the effect on greenhouse gas emissions and other services. Because for example, some other ecosystem services could be compromised, for example, the ones related to um, um, yeah, to reducing the risk of erosion um, and also more field operations would be needed and especially there is a very low acceptance for, from farmers in removing um, cover crop residues from the field. So this is an option that in case should uh, be further investigated before it can be um, implemented. So some key points uh, to sum up. Agroecological practices have a great potential for climate change adaptation and mitigation. One of these practices is using cover crops, uh, which provide extra carbon input to during unproductive periods. Um, and they also retain residual nitrogen and if legumes are included, can add more, therefore reducing the need for extra input and also leaching losses. But there are some possible trade-offs between carbon sequestration and nitrous oxide emissions, which could be managed by uh, selecting the right cover crop species for specific conditions and also adopting other management uh, strategies. All this to optimize their mitigation potential. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and if you have any questions, I will try to answer. Okay, thank you, Chiara, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we are now collecting different questions from the audience. I suppose there will be a lot of questions because we have a lot of participants uh, to this talk. Uh, meanwhile, I would like to ice break. Uh, with a question from my own and after I leave the floor to the other ones. So from my side, I would like to ask you, first of all, if is it possible to manage cover crops to maximize their potential for mitigation? That's my first question. Yeah, so yeah, there are several ways of managing cover crops. Um, one of the ways, and I didn't show the results now, but one of the ways that uh, we were trying to investigate was um, about the determination. So they can be when, so winter cover crops can die off during winter and then they are winter killed. When this doesn't happen, they can be plowed in directly. Um, or another option is to first rotovate them. So to have a first stage of initial decomposition of the biomass and then incorporate them in the soil. This was shown to have some effect on nitrous oxide emission because you would um, start up the process of the composition before incorporating them in the field where um, the conditions are optimal for nitrous oxide emission. And this is because to have nitrous oxide emission, um, you need to have a low level of oxygen. So if you start up the process in contact with a lot of oxygen, then you reduce the risk of nitrous oxide emissions. I don't know if it's clear what I mean, but this is one of the options that could be adopted. Um, <clears throat> and then, Another way could be, for example, again, I talked about species selection, mostly focusing on um, legumes versus non-legumes. But another possibility is to select species that, uh, for example, have some 
um, compounds that can inhibit nitrification. For example, plantain, Plantago officinalis, was shown to have an inhibit inhibitory effect on um, nitrification, uh, but this was shown in pastures, uh, so it has yet to be shown in cover crops, but it is a possibility um, to investigate. And then another um, something else to consider is also the timing of operations. So, and in this context, it's crucial to have um, the ability of predict also uh, <laughs> weather conditions. So maybe avoiding uh, incorporating um, this very easily digestible or degradable um, biomass before um, a high rainfall, a heavy rainfall event would help reducing the risk of nitrous oxide emission, which again, again needs uh, specific conditions to happen. For example, high level of humidity and low oxygen level. Okay, okay. Thank you. I could have um, many other questions, but I would like to leave the, the floor to the participants. Uh, yeah. So. The first question is by Annie Shalabi. How does additionality come into play in the case of agro agroecology? How does the design of the project guarantees the carbon credits? This is the first question from the audience. Yeah, I must say that I'm not an expert on carbon credits. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer this question um, properly. Okay, okay. So now another question from Filippo Bassi. If removal of residues is okay, can grazing of cereal, cereal stubble be considered maybe by promoting intercropping with forages? In North Africa, summer grazing is critical for farmers' livelihood and a major impediment to the adop adoption of practice. So <clears throat> if I understand the question correctly, um, do you mean intercropping of cover crops? So having the cereals grown at the same time with cover crops, because I'm not sure I understand. So grazing of cereal stubble by promoting intercropping with forages. If that's what you mean, then yes, it is actually one of the yeah one of the ways of also increasing biomass production of cover crops is by under sowing it in the previous crop. So, for example, if you have a cereal, then you would um, you would establish the cover crop before terminating the cover crop uh, before terminating the main crop. So you have a period um, of intercropping. So you have the cereal and, for example, forage uh, species that grow at the same time. And I think the correct way to call this is relay intercropping. Um, and then it, would, it could definitely be an option. Then it could be used for grazing. OK, OK, thank you. So another question from Andrea Cavina. Given all the benefits you mentioned, what are the main barriers to cover crops implementation? I can, I can think, for instance, of economic costs, cultural habits, and lobbying from fertilizer producing companies. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, well, economic costs are it is, is a very big barrier because, of course, it, there are additional field operations needed for sowing the cover crops and then for um, yeah, incorporating them or yeah, depending on how they are managed, but there are additional operations and then also for the seeds. So this is a very big barrier. And also I think it's not that obvious for many farmers what benefits that they can obtain. And this I must say is also linked to the fact that now I talked a lot about um, the beneficial effect on the following crop, so that there's more nitrogen provided to the following crop 
so that the yield of the following crop can be increased or input can be reduced. This is not always true because it depends on, again, the selection of cover crop species. Um, there are some cover crop species that don't provide this benefit because they, um, they do something that is called preemptive competition. So they empty the soil too much um, so that too little nitrogen is left for the following crop. Therefore, farmers see a negative effect on the following crop rather than a benefit, and they don't want that. Um, but again, this is all about management and selecting the right species under the right conditions. Um, so I think a way to overcome this specific barrier would be to be better at advising farmers and, and communicating this. Okay, okay. So some participants ask for uh, the video. We, we, I would like to recall that the video will be available in next days on CMCC YouTube channel. Furthermore, now uh, we move another question from Lorenzo Villani. It is known the impact of cover crops on the water balance components at the watershed scale. Is it significant? Um, this also really depends on the specific conditions. Um, so the effect on the water balance uh, varies a lot. For example, in Mediterranean climate, it can also be negative. So water availability could be reduced uh, by having cover crops rather than improved. So it's a bit difficult to give a general answer to this question because it's very, very context specific. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, another question now from Laura Zamboni. Okay. What would you ultimately advise farmers to do? My impression is that scientific findings are to be boiled down into pragmatic guidelines. For example, in the reference to the rural environmental condition, does that mean choosing a cover crop based on seasonal forecasts? This is also yeah, a very good point. Um, I would say that, so just to mention that the name of the project um, where the last results that I was showing come from is called Cover Crop Rotate, meaning that also cover crops should be rotated in the crop rotation. And what um, I mean by that is that the species, so cover crop species should be selected based on um, the service that you want them to provide within a specific crop rotation. But rather than seasonal forecast, um, it's crucial to car carefully consider the previous crop and the following crop. For example, if you have um, faba or a grain legume, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a legume in the cover crop afterwards. They're the service that you want to provide, so the ecosystem service that might be more relevant to have is to uh, retain the extra nitrogen that you have in the soil, maybe left from the crop residues from the, pre the preceding legume. So in that case, maybe it would be better to have a brassica or a grass. In, uh, in another situation where maybe you have, um, um, I don't know, a brassica as a previous crop uh, with a high input of nitrogen fertilizers, then yeah, well, no, actually, in that case, you would also like to have something that retains the nitrogen. But if you have a previous crop that um, takes up a lot of nitrogen from the soil, then maybe you want to have a legume afterward to enrich the soil again. I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but in simple words, what I mean is that the recommendation that I would give to farmers is that the selection of cover crops should be specific for the service that they want the cover crop to provide. And in this, what should be considered is not only 
the species, but the functional traits of those cover crops. And it is something that has been more and more studied in recent years, actually. Okay, okay. Thank you for the extensive answer. So uh, another question from Panos Panagos. Are the experimental results coming only from Arauz or you have also experimental sites in Italy? By the way, the EU European Soil Observatory develops a monitoring network for NQO monitoring. I would love to have <laughs> some experimental sites in Italy. Um, let's say not yet. I've, I mean, I came back to Italy April last year. So um, the answer is not yet. But I'm very interested in uh, collaborating. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, another question from Francesco Cara. Um, I wonder whether in the past, before industrialization of agriculture, cover crops were, was a standard practice that was later abandoned. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I guess it might be. I mean, it, to me, it just makes sense not to leave the the soil empty um, so maybe it was not called cover crops um, but i can imagine that it was something that was done but i i don't know maybe there are some informations on this okay uh, another question from angelica marchetti do you know which indicators can be used for measuring adaptation to climate change instead yeah for example in this case water availability would be uh, one. So if you have water, I mean, if you have problems with um, water scarcity, then it, it's even, I mean, the selection of core crop species, for example, should be aimed at having something that doesn't deplete um, water for the following crop uh, too much. Um, so an indicator for adaptation in this case would be yeah, water availability for the following crop, especially when there are drought is a risk. Okay. Okay, now we move another questions. Uh, I'm curious to ask more info about the seeds you consider for the Kroger crops of your experiments. Where the seeds come from regarding their genetic? Can you explain a little bit more about? Yeah, this is generally from well, most of the experiments that I was personally personally conducted were within uh, organic uh, management. So the seeds were provided by seed producers um, that were certified organic. But yeah, I mean, again, this is also, it depends from, this was done in Denmark. So the, the seed companies were Danish based. But in that case, it was uh, organic seed producers. Okay, okay. Now, probably a much more general questions from Zenebe Mekonen. What is, I don't know if you can address it in general, but what is the difference between agroclimate and agroecology? How this will affect the role of cover crops differently? I am not completely sure I know what you mean by agroclimate. Um, so then I mean, maybe, I don't know if you can try to. Okay. okay. Uh, I would like to ask him or her to add additional insights yeah. to make possible the answer. So, meanwhile, we can move on to another question from Claudia Damatirka. He was wondering how stable is the SOC sequestered by cover crops? Is it a carbon that is easily mineralized by microorganisms and then does lost as CO2, or is it more stable in time? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. And um I also had an additional slide in case this came. Um, so the point is that <clears throat> there are several views or an evolving understanding of how carbon is stabilized in the soil. 
in the past 10 years, let's say, the emerging understanding is that the most stable form of carbon is the one that has been um, through a microbe. So when carbon is um, de degraded by microbes, then it becomes more stable in their body. Uh, just to use very simple words, maybe too simple. So if we have cover crop biomass that is digested by microorganisms and the carbon coming from cover crops uh, becomes part of that microorganism, for example, their um, cell walls, then that carbon will be stable in the long term. But what happens is that there is an initial release of carbon dioxide. So if we look at the short term, then it could look like um, it's less stable. If we increase the time perspective, then we will probably find a larger proportion of that easily degradable carbon compared to, um, for example, some lignin that takes longer to degrade, but maybe doesn't become part of that uh, uh, microbial cell walls that are so stable in time. So that is also why in the long term, I mean, we need to, we need to adapt the time perspective when we think about um, greenhouse gases and, and greenhouse, balance, greenhouse gas balance. Okay, okay, thank you. Now another question from Tommaso Brazzini. Uh, would you leave the cover crops to complete the full life cycle if they survive the winter? In this way, they can be self-repeating. Or maybe the cutting and mulching or incorporating is better? Um, yes. I mean, there the risk, if you leave them, then the risk is that you would compromise the sowing of the following crop. So what can be done? Um, but in that case, then, so one option is to have one year of uh, fallow or let's say temporary grassland um, in the crop rotation so that you have, you under sow your uh, cover crops in um, the year before, and then you leave them for an entire year. But that's different from a cover crop. I don't know if I'm making my if I'm explaining myself. So the point with cover crops is that they they don't compromise the yield of the following crop, or they they don't compete with cash crops. Um, so if leaving them for too long means compromising the the productivity of the following cash crop, then it would not be recommended. And what I mentioned before about this preemptive co competition, yet yeah, this is what can happen if they are not terminated um, at the right time. So if they are left for too long, then they could deplete um, soil nitrogen, but also water too much for the following crop. So mulching and incorporating is better in that sense, because then they cannot actually and give a benefit for the following crop. Okay, okay. Now another question about, have you tried to calculate the global warming potential for cover crop fields, more or less than ask, scaling up the approach that you have carried out at scale? Uh, um, the, the global potential. warming potential, yeah. The, the point is that that generally refers to greenhouse gases. Um, so I don't know, I can answer with something else that I think it's interesting, but maybe goes in the direction of your question. One of the aspects that uh, is rarely considered, but in some studies is mentioned, is that having a cover crop also has an effect on the albedo of the field. So. Um, for example, in Nordic uh, countries where you could have a snow cover during winter, 
snow has a very high albedo, so it reflects a lot of the incoming uh, radiation. If you have cover crops, they have lower albedo, so they reflect less of this radiation, therefore increasing the temperature at the regional um, level. Um, so, and, and this is not much considered, but in some studies they looked at it, and if it was considered also in the selection of species, it could actually have an impact on the on the overall effect of cover crops. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, now we are moving to the final ones. Uh, another question from Laura Zamboni. Do you know of exemplary firms of good enterprises that take a science-based approach to this practice? How to identify that without advertising? Um, um, I must say that not yet in Italy, at least. Um, I haven't had enough time to interact with many farmers here. There were some farmers in, in Denmark, so through the advisory service, the farmers advisory service uh, in Denmark, we had also good contacts with some farmers which were very interested in trying out um, good practices. And, and it was, I must say that that was very, very uh, enriching as a collaboration to have because both because of their expertise and their practical knowledge, but also because they would ask questions or raise uh, points that we might not be considering. But I think that also that in general, the approach would be to go through the advisory uh, systems. So also here, that's what I would do. Okay, okay. After we have another question from Simin Nazle Eskandar. Has the research been done regarding the effect of agroecology and climate change in the city? I don't know if you have some insights or about... I don't uh, know, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're thinking about maybe urban farming, um, I'm sure that there has been research done, um, but I cannot um, suggest anything right right now. Um, okay, okay. Well, now uh, finding for other questions. Okay, another last minute questions mm -hmm. from Andrea Cavina again. How do multi-year crops, uh, such as anti-grains that not require tilling, sowing, and the like, compare with the cycle cash cover crops? Um, and here I would ask compare in relation to what? Of course, I mean, having, um, well, tillage, is not necessary. You could have cover crops without tillage, but that would require, for example, terminating them with herbicides or uh, with roller roll, roller crimping and direct seeding. So it, it is possible to have uh, reduced tillage or no till and cover crops. Of course, if this, if we think also about um, I mean, completely different cropping systems, then maybe having the core crops would not be ideal because maybe they would not grow um, well, yeah, they would not grow well enough to provide any service. But that's just to say that they are, they are not necessarily exclusive. So you, you could have both. Okay, okay. Only to say that uh, he had in relation to reducing emissions, carbon absorption, and soil erosion. Yeah. yeah. Um, but here, I mean, in terms of results, I would say that, again, it's context specific because, for example, soil erosion depends also on slope and, um, I mean, the erosion risk of that specific uh, area, soil type. So it's, again, 
agroecology comes uh, useful in this case because it's a context specific approach. So there is not a one option that is best in every context. Maybe in some contexts, it would be better to have uh, multi-year crops such as antique grains in other contexts, um, other type of cropping systems. Okay, okay. So I would say that it's time to end the webinar. I would like again to thank you for a very nice, interesting presentation and all the attendances uh, that um, have also very interesting questions to address specific curiosity and to improve discussion today. I would like again to recall you to follow the CMCC on our social channels. I would like to also to have information about the next CMCC webinars. Thank you to all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Guido.